It was spring of the year 2000. The last U.S. presidential campaign was in full swing, and Texas Governor George W. Bush had wrapped up the Republican nomination. We get to send a signal that we're sick and tired of Clinton Gore in Washington, D.C. He needed a running mate. The Bush family asked an old friend, his father's defense secretary, Halliburton CEO Dick Cheney, to lead the search for the best man. It didn't take long for Cheney to find him. I'm proud to announce that Dick Cheney, a man of great integrity, sound judgment, and experience, is my choice to be the next vice president of the United States. Mr. Cheney, how do you feel about being picked, sir? Pretty good. Dick Cheney's relationship with George W. Bush has been characterized in many ways as the president's mentor, his minder as the man who's really in charge. It's not me. What Cheney and those close to him also brought to the White House was an absolute belief that the 21st century would belong to America and that it would start with the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. Saddam is ousted. Um, you get rid of the top leadership, you get a moderate Ba'athist regime, and a democracy flows out of, uh, um, uh, like water out of a fountain. And not only will democracy flow in Iraq, it'll flow in, into Syria. Syria will see the light. The Iranians will still see the light. Seymour Hirsch is one of America's foremost investigative journalists. He says even before 9-11, Dick Cheney was insistent the U.S. must invade Iraq and begin changing the world. Just go in, it's going to roll over. They believe this. They believe this utopian, idealist, uh, crazy. Dick Cheney's moment arrived with those jetliners on September 11th. His plan was now on the fast track. After September 11th, as after the invasion of Kuwait a decade earlier, it was Dick Cheney's job to sell a war against Iraq. We all have to recognize as a nation that 9-11 uh, that changed a great deal in our lives. We know that Saddam Hussein had the intent to arm his regime with weapons, weapons of mass destruction. We do know with absolute certainty that he is using his procurement system to acquire the equipment he needs in order to enrich uranium to build a nuclear weapon. According to Seymour Hersh, selling that nuclear threat was crucial for Cheney to convince Americans to support the war. With that case, they could not only they could not only win the public, but they could win the Senate, the Democrats in the Senate. You, you know, you have to understand, without that case, I don't think they could have gotten the authority. The problem was that though the Central Intelligence Agency had been tasked to find evidence of Saddam's WMDs, especially nuclear weapons, that's not what the best information showed. Dick Cheney visited CIA headquarters. Not once, the record shows, but eight separate times. He's said to have wanted to see more forward-leaning intelligence on Iraq. Analysts get the drift. They get the drift. They write reports critical. They go nowhere. They write a report that supports the White House. All of a sudden, they're giving briefings at the White House. Come on. Everybody gets the drift. About the same time, the Pentagon established a secretive group to work closely with the vice president on intelligence matters. It was known as the OSP, the Office of Special Plans. Their starting point was not, let's try to figure out what was going on, but let's see what kind of information we can come up with to justify the policy line that we wish to pursue. Greg Thielman was an intelligence specialist with the State Department who watched the emergence of the OSP. It soon became clear to him what its mission was and who was behind it. Cheney was, was the driving force behind an orchestrated presentation to the American public of a different version of reality than, than at least the reality that we saw. In the intelligence business, that's called cherry picking, selecting individual morsels of information that support a certain view. And stovepiping, sending them without analysis right to the White House to be inserted into the president's script. Facing clear evidence of peril, we cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun. 
when I heard those speeches and read the transcripts, I recognized many of the anecdotes, many of the examples from things we were being given. Former Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Karen Kwiatkowski was at the Pentagon, working closely with the OSP staff. Having seen the intelligence, I knew that this was a uh, manipulation of information. It was cherry-picked information, out-of-context information, in many cases uh, information presented as confirmed when in fact it had not been ever confirmed by the intelligence community. For instance, Kwiatkowski says the OSP touted an attempt by Saddam to purchase uranium for a nuclear weapon. Without explaining, it occurred almost 15 years earlier when Iraq was a U.S. ally. It bothered me a great deal because I saw it to be manipulation. I saw it to be conscious manipulation, not an oversight, but consciously done. That's how it appeared to me. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. How are you doing? Another example, a primary source named Ahmed Shalabi, then perhaps the best-known Iraqi expatriate. His organization was paid more than $300,000 a month to provide intelligence to the Office of Special Plans. Well, come on, you're going to pay somebody $345,000 you know, a month, you're going to get your money's worth, right? He's, he wants to keep the checks coming. He's going to keep telling you things. How are you, sir? My pleasure to meet you. Thank you. How are Hello. you? Nice Chalabi, a convicted bank swindler who hadn't lived in Iraq since he was 13, hoped to become the new Iraqi president when Saddam was ousted. His OSP reports were routinely optimistic, predicting American troops would be greeted as liberators. This is what allowed uh, Iraqi National Congress, uh, Chalabi, uh, reports that have proven uh, to be completely, either completely fabricated or, or, or completely wrong uh, to get to the President of the United States without the, the proper kind of labels. We asked ex-CIA Director James Woolsey if intelligence gathering could also be improperly influenced by Dick Cheney's unprecedented eight visits to CIA headquarters. Would you accept it is possible that the reaction to that kind of relationship with the Vice President would be what some call stove piping or cherry picking, where, you're, where you, you look for the kind of intelligence you believe they want and give it to them? Yeah, I suppose it's a, a, a possible reaction of someone, but if people reacted that way as intelligence officers, they ought to be removed and replaced by people with backbone. Uh, you don't believe that kind of thing happened in this case with Iraq? I wasn't present in any of the conversations, but whether the vice president uh, said something with a frown on his face or a smile on his face, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the, it's the DCI, the CI director's job uh, to encourage his people to call it straight and it's their job to call it straight. But former Pentagon staffer Karen Kwiatkowski says that's not what she saw happening. If you disagree with Dick Cheney, the highly predictable result is you will no longer be working for Dick Cheney. Indeed, as 2002 became 2003 and the drums of war grew louder, the intelligence quoted by U.S. officials was unanimous. Saddam Hussein was unquestionably a nuclear threat. Within a two-week or three-week period, every senior official began to talk about mushroom clouds. <laughs> How many believed it? I, I think most of them did. When we return, truth and consequences at the White House. It is essentially the betrayal of our country. It is a treasonous act.